Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we interrupt your regularly scheduled stream of Activision Blizzard and Microsoft acquisition videos for a little sojourn into a lesson that I have taught in virtual legality before, but that everyone should take to heart. One of the very first videos that we did in this series was about false advertising and whether or not you could go and request a refund. For what? At that point in time, it was for the purchase of a game called Fallout 76. And we went through the terms of service. We talked about how various warranties and indemnification and refund provisions would work. We also talked about false advertising, about stating something about how your product operates that doesn't make it into the final thing that the developer, or in this case, movie studio, has created. And that false advertising generally requires some kind of knowledge component, whether that's an intention to deceive or knowledge about the deceptive aspect of what you're doing. It requires you to have a state of mind that intends to be doing something bad. And because when we're talking about gaming here in virtual legality, we're talking about relatively small order purchases, $50, $60, not $6,000, not things that can harm you physically, generally speaking. We talked about the fact that the FTC or the various government regulators in the various states here in the United States generally doesn't concern itself with those kinds of things as much as refrigerators that spoil your food or pharmaceuticals that can kill you. So when people come and talk to me about this, they say, well, then why are these lawsuits happening? How can this happen that happened in the news that I saw today? How can the Hollywood Reporter report two days ago the following? Lawsuit claims Universal duped Ana de Armas fans into watching the movie yesterday. Universal was sued on Friday in a class action accusing the studio of tricking fans by featuring Ana de Armas in trailers for yesterday when she's not in the movie. Now, the Hollywood Reporter didn't deign to give us the actual lawsuit document, but no worries, as we do in Virtual Legality, we found it. We're going to go over it a little bit with you, not in as great a detail as we've done other lawsuits, because to be frank, it's not a strong one. But one of the things that I try to impress upon my prospective clients, my current clients, viewers, listeners, is the following, especially in the United States. As you can see on the thumbnail, anyone can sue anyone for anything. You don't even have to have met the person to actually file a lawsuit against them in a court in American law. You don't have to have a good argument, a good claim to file that lawsuit and to get it reported on in places like the Hollywood Reporter. There are other jurisdictions that have various ways of making sure that their lawsuits are at least in some part legitimate before you drag the defendant in and it gets reported on in various places. The United States is not one of those jurisdictions. So indeed, the plaintiffs in this prospective class action lawsuit have claimed that this short scene featuring Anna de Armas in the trailer for the movie yesterday, which is about, I think it's about Beatles songs that have disappeared and some guy that remakes them and gets rich, I think. Haven't seen the movie. If you have, leave a comment in the description. Let me know if it's any good. But here's a shot of Anna de Armas. There's a couple of these in the trailer for the film. And apparently this scene got cut. Like so many other scenes in the entire history of motion picture making. Do you like Ty Burrell? I loved him in The Incredible Hulk, didn't you? What do you mean this scene that they're showing in the trailer wasn't in the movie? What do you mean that I think almost every aspect of this character got killed from the theatrical release? I do believe he appeared in an extended release at some point in time. You'll have to check me on that as well. But these are just examples I plucked out that I remembered personally about instances where things changed from trailer to movie. And those appear to be accidental, right? Ty Burrell was intended to be in the movie, didn't fit into the overall plot. They tried to make a better quality picture by the time it released. And his subplot got removed. This happens all the time. So that appears to be what occurred here. And in fact, we'll see in the court filings that that's in fact what the plaintiffs basically allege happened, kind of. But we've also seen more intentional deception. In fact, we've covered it here in this space in virtual legality. What do we feel about Marvel Studios? Again, deliberately deceiving, right? 
Can you file a lawsuit against Infinity War? Can you file a lawsuit against Marvel and Disney today because their trailer for the Infinity War movie has the Hulk in it when the Hulk doesn't appear in that film, at least not in this form, certainly not in that position or geography for this specific shot? Now, they did that to hide some of the plot points because they felt that that would result in a better product and service going out to their customers, which is going to be pretty good defense in a court of law in most instances. But you could still argue, I only bought my ticket to Infinity War in order to see the Hulk charge in Wakanda. Now, I do think you'd get laughed out of court, just as I'm going to suggest that this particular case would get laughed out of court. But you might be able to get your refund. Now, would you be able to get your refund from Disney? Probably not. Probably you'd go get your refund from AMC or Cinemark or wherever else you wound up seeing this particular motion picture, which is one of the things I'm going to raise as part of this particular document. But I do want to talk about it because this is a pretty weak lawsuit document. It's reported on in The Hollywood Reporter and elsewhere in fandom and various places as weak. It's almost a kind of laugher. But it's still worth noting because this is still going to cost legal time and expense and a judge has been assigned in order to dismiss this or potentially take a portion of it up. And so we do need to talk about these kinds of things because this lawsuit exists. So it claims to be a consumer protection class action. Among other deceptions, defendants nationwide advertising and promotion of the movie yesterday represents to prospective movie viewers that the world famous actress Anna de Armas has a substantial character role in the film. I do have to warn you in advance. This winds up sounding like a fan fiction website that's just really into Anna de Armas. So I skipped most of that in the highlights to this particular lawsuit, but it does come out a lot. These appear to be really big fans of hers. Now, it's also worth noting the defendant here is not Amazon, where these plaintiffs appear to have purchased their rental license of the film. Instead, the defendant is the American film production and distribution company that advertises, sells, broadcast license, and distributes feature films, including yesterday. So it's the distributor slash studio. We don't quite get a great description of who made this. It's Universal City Studios doing business as Universal Pictures. I assume it's a Universal movie. So it appears to be against the studio that made the film and distributed it. But keep in mind as we go through this, that when you rent something or if you purchase something, we want to get out of the digital sphere, your contract, your privity, we would say in the law is with the retailer. It's with the seller that you bought from. You get the warranties, you get the contract, you get the relationship from the seller of goods. It doesn't necessarily go all the way back to the producer, distributor, or manufacturer. In fact, when you open up some products that you get home, you'll see in that instruction book exactly what you got from the manufacturer, whether it's a limited warranty or something else. And that privity matters because they're suing the producers of the movie, but it's a very unclear exactly what contractual relationship these plaintiffs had with those producers rather than with Amazon or Vudu or wherever else you might rent your particular movie titles. It appears to be Amazon based on the context here. We'll see why that's an issue that isn't properly kind of covered in the way they draft this document in just a little bit. Defendant's movie yesterday, however, fails to include any appearance of Anna de Armas whatsoever. Plaintiffs bring this action individually and on behalf of all other similarly situated consumers to halt the dissemination of defendants' false, deceptive, and misleading representations. To correct the false, deceptive, and misleading perception defendants' representations have created in the minds of consumers and to obtain redress, dollar dollar bills, for those who have purchased, rented, licensed, or otherwise paid for attending showings of the movie yesterday. We want this halted, this affront to justice and advertising because Anna de Armas appears in a trailer for 20 seconds and doesn't appear in the final film. Now, they describe themselves as follows. On or about October 31st, 2021, Plaintiff Rosa watched defendant's advertisement of the movie yesterday in the form of a movie trailer accessed and viewed using Amazon.com's internet movie streaming service. The movie trailer which Plaintiff Rosa viewed was false, misleading, and deceptive. Among other false representations, the trailer promoted Anna de Armas as an actress that would appear in the film. Persuaded by the movie trailer to view the film yesterday because of its false representations, Plaintiff Rosa rented the movie. And relying on those false, deceptive, and misleading representations, Plaintiff Rosa purchased rights to view the movie yesterday for approximately $3. 
and 99 cents. He was separated from his funds. This goes on to suggest that there's another plaintiff here, and this goes in another direction for a lawsuit of this type. They grabbed someone from California because they want to use some California laws. They grabbed someone from Maryland because they want to use some Maryland laws. I think they want the warranty laws over there. I don't think that's terribly helpful to them, but they grabbed them, said they're both plaintiffs for a putative class action, and then talk about California plaintiffs and Maryland plaintiffs in this federal filing. It's a very odd approach to even bringing this lawsuit, but that's what they've done. So they got this Maryland plaintiff. He kind of says the same thing, wished Anna de Armas were in it. Upon watching the rented movie, she wasn't in it. He spent his $3.99 as well. And now they want to get redress in federal court because if you give us this class action, it'll be worth more than $5 million. You get up to the big numbers, you can sue in federal court, which is what they're claiming here. Then we get a whole series of paragraphs about how awesome Anna de Armas is. I apologize, I'm going to skip most of those. She was in some movies. They like her. Yesterday in its trailer, Ms. de Armas was originally cast to co-star in the film Yesterday as a character named Roxanne. Accordingly, scenes featuring Ms. de Armas as the character Roxanne were shot for inclusion in the original version of the movie. That's an interesting recital because it does suggest an important aspect to this. If you were making a movie that didn't ever include Anna de Armas, and instead you filmed scenes solely to put in the trailer just in order to get marketing, then maybe you could claim some kind of nefarious, oppressive, false advertising scheme by a movie studio that never intended to have her in the movie. But this paragraph actually goes and talks about what her role was going to be. It then continues on and says the director found her portrayal of Roxanne as brilliant and she was radiant in the role. And they're upset that they don't get this scene in the film, but it also belies what their actual legal claim is that this was deliberately fraudulent by talking about how she was intended to be in the film. And then things change when you make creative products. The principal actors in the movie yesterday were largely unknown, plaintiffs say. Consequently, because none of the yesterday film leads were famous, defendant could not rely on their fame to promote the movie to entice viewership. Defendant consequently used Ms. de Armas' fame, radiance, and brilliance. You don't see that every day in a legal document. To promote the film by including her scenes in the movie trailers advertising yesterday. Adding to its deceptiveness, the trailer for yesterday also included the Something Song joke, which director Boyle described as one of his favorites, and which he explained delighted him. And again, when you think about this in a vacuum, outside of just this legal document, in this weird space we call virtual legality, imagine if every different cut in a trailer could be sued against because it didn't appear in exactly the same way in the final production of a film that was being made while that trailer was being made. Most recently, you might have seen a trailer for a very small film called Spider-Man No Way Home. And in that film, you have Doctor Strange telling the people that are involved in that plot to Scooby-Doo that crap. That's what's said in the trailer. And he says crap very specifically. I found it to be a fairly funny way that Benedict Cumberbatch, a natural British-born actor with his normal accent, speaking American, says the word crap in that context. But if you actually go to the movie theater and you watch Spider-Man No Way Home, he doesn't say that line. He says, Scooby-Doo, that shit. And I found it to be a little bit less effective, but I'm not the director of the film and I really didn't lose the value of my entire ticket because the cut that was in that trailer didn't exactly and identically match what was portrayed in the film. But you see these kinds of debates on Reddit or online all the time where a director has chosen a different take, a different wording than what appears in the trailer. And if we were to go down this road where a lawsuit like this could win, you wouldn't just have trouble with The Incredible Hulk. You wouldn't just have trouble with Infinity War or maybe every Marvel movie that's ever been released, including No Way Home, which hid some important plot details in that very trailer I'm describing. You'd have issues with virtually every trailer ever made, not just for movies, but for video games, which we're more used to talking about here. Part of this lawsuit, as we will see, is the fact that the trailers that were built presumably when Anna de Armas was going to be in the film, continue to advertise the film here in 2022 and 2021 and 2020 when it should be known to everybody that she's not in the movie, but that trailer was produced, that cost money, and Amazon and Vudu and whoever else are still using it to advertise the film in order to entice you to get that rental. But 
if we were to take this argument to its logical conclusion, we would force everybody everywhere that ever made a trailer that didn't quite match the final product to pull them down as soon as that became apparent, or more specifically, as soon as their product was released and whatever was portrayed in that trailer was no longer accurate, which would just be an enormous burden and cost and real detriment to putting out creative materials to no particular effect other than to assuage the fears and the love of Anna de Armas that plaintiffs like this have. So whenever you're thinking about these kinds of questions, and we're going to wind up in a kind of equitable analysis here, is this fair, is it not? Because that's how false advertising kind of lives. It's important to note, what would this mean if we were to go down this road? And if we went down this road, whole swaths of creative endeavor would have added costs to them for really no reason whatsoever. Paragraph 35, defendants' false representations that an actress, song, and other scene elements would appear in the film yesterday when they did not collectively comprise a false, deceptive, and misleading movie trailer advertisement. And I think the normal viewing public understands, especially with respect to songs and things like that, that there are no promises made when a song appears in a trailer, right? There are a lot of songs that appear in trailers that I wish were in the movies, but those trailer songs are done way before the score is done, and you get whatever you get with the score most times. And so you could view that as deceptive if you were really inclined to do so. But when we talk about deception, we also incorporate what is kind of the standard reasonable person standard, right? When we look at this, we say, would you expect that song to necessarily be in the movie? You say, I hope it is. But no, I don't expect it because I understand how trailers work. And I have been to this rodeo before. Defendant has consistently promoted Ms. De Armas as a character starring in the film. Have they? They're only really referring to the trailer here. They've got a clip that they show from the trailer on CBS this morning. Movie trailers, says the plaintiffs, are understood by movie viewers and consumers to convey what actors will appear in the advertised film. And I think that's fair, right? Like all good discussions here, there are aspects of it that walk up to the line. As I suggested, if you never intended to put a very famous actor or actress in your film and you cut a few things and plop them in the trailer just to deceive, well, then you might have a point. But if you intended for them to be a subplot that ultimately wound up on the cutting room floor, well, that's just an accident of history. And you don't have the necessary mens rea, mental state, to actually defraud when you're making those advertising materials to start out with. Now, we could have a reasoned debate about whether you should have to pull those down after the fact. I would argue that you shouldn't have to because that's too much cost for very little gain. But we could have that debate as these plaintiffs would like us to. You see all these years referenced here. They continue, they keep talking about years, they keep talking about trailers. They've got some clips for us, some of which you saw at the top of this video, all of which take place. This ends at 2.14 of that trailer. It starts at 2.04. I might have been too generous, suggesting it was 20 seconds of a three minute long trailer. It might be 10 seconds. So there is an element of materiality that we look at here as well. Could you actually have the entire value of your ticket lost because you were advertised something at 10 seconds out of three minutes? Even if we grant you your arguments, do we really think that you should get your $4 back for that particular loss of a scene? And I think reasonable minds can differ on every point, but I don't think there's a lot of reasonable minds telling you that that is in fact the case. Continuing, the plaintiffs say, because consumers were not provided with the movie product that they were promised by the yesterday movie trailer, they were effectively provided with no value at all. And that's the argument you got to make. If you're going to seek damages for that entire $4, which only becomes $5 million if you bring in everybody in California and everybody in Maryland and say that they too were motivated by exactly the same reasons to go and see this movie, which is the problem with actually asking for a class action here, but we're not going to dive into that too deeply, that your value proposition went to zero dollars. You would have never spent a penny if you had known that Anna de Armas wasn't in this film. Is somebody going to say that's true? Probably. There are probably folks that say, hey, I love that actor. I, got, I watched the trailer. I'm going to get it because they are in the movie and they never appeared and my value went to zero. I guess you really didn't like the film at that point in time. Now, they have some class definition stuff here. You see it reported in The Hollywood Reporter as being a class action. This is what we call putative class action. You ask the court to certify your class. And the important part about certifying a class is that you have to represent people that are all in the same spot, that have the same legal arguments. And unfortunately here, what you've got is a very idiosyncratic set of plaintiffs, 
right? They have to make the argument that they had a total loss in value and would never have rented the film yesterday if they had known Anna de Armas wasn't in it. And they're claiming that everybody that rented it is in the same position. And ugh, that's a tough argument to make. It's pretty easy to kick out. And I expect you will see it kicked out. But let's pretend that it's not. Let's pretend that they've got their class action and they're proceeding to look at the claims for relief that they asked for. What do they ask for? Well, first, they ask for that old chestnut, a violation of the California unfair competition law, the UCL, common refrain here in virtual legality, the very ambiguous, very amorphous, it does whatever you want it to do. Law in California, this was the one place that Epic had a momentary victory against Apple in their case, was on unfair competition premises. But as you might recall, if you've been in virtual legality for a while, generally speaking, we see this as the umbrella count after you tell the court what you're actually interested in. It's very rare that you see this brought up first because it is so amorphous and ambiguous. You bring it up at the end as a kind of backstop to the very important things you've told the court are a problem today. By bringing it up first, you kind of give away the game a little bit because the UCL basically just says, we have unfair competition. It's unlawful, unfair, or fraudulent business act or practice, or if it's unfair, deceptive, untrue, or misleading advertising, you're in trouble. It's very, very short. It's prohibited. It's bad. And they want to climb on this language of unfair, deceptive, untrue, or misleading advertising. But again, this is a backstop law. And we're going to see the issue that they have with the actual false advertising law in California. Now, they go off on this long crusade here talking about unfair business practices, making representations and omissions and material facts, things that we've seen in the rest of their document. They violate and offend public policy against false advertising. And if you're in California, I would argue that you are offending public policy by suggesting that movie studios have to cover all of this forever and ever, amen, without ever changing what is the substance of their movie because a trailer has gone out the door. But that's neither here nor there. They don't really make a legal claim here except to repeat that it's unfair and it's malicious and it's fraudulent and all the stuff that we've talked about in other contexts and in this document itself. Then they get to count two where they actually talk about the specific law that they think is violated, what they call the FAL or false advertising law. Now they summarize it here but because we're in virtual legality, we can summarize it for ourselves, and we can see the following. It is unlawful to dispose of real or personal property, that's basically anything that's physical, or to perform services to make or disseminate any statement which is untrue or misleading, which is known or should be known to be untrue or misleading, or to so make or disseminate any such statement as part of a plan or scheme with the intent not to sell that personal property or those services, so advertised at the price stated, or as so advertised otherwise. Bunch of legalese, right? But I tried to highlight it for you. It's unlawful with the intent to sell something to make a statement that is untrue, which is known or should be known by you to be untrue. There's your mens rea. There's your mental state. We'll see how the plaintiffs skip it in this document. Or to make or disseminate such a statement as part of a grander plan or scheme with the intent not to sell or perform those services as you advertised. And that's closer to what they're aimed at, right? But they don't want this intent here. I highlight it in red. They don't like that because then they have to show that the movie distributor did this deliberately when I think we can all intuitively understand that they probably didn't that they thought Anna DeArmas was going to be in the film, that their director says she was great in the film, and that I bet you could find quotes that go along with those ones where he says she was great that say, but the subplot just didn't work in the film and we wanted to make it better for the people. I bet you can find that quote somewhere out there from Danny Boyle. If you do, put a link in your comments to this video. But ultimately, what you're looking at here is you can't make untrue statements if you know they're untrue and you can't have a plan to sell something outside of what you're telling people it is if that was your intent. And they summarize it kind of that way. They skip that plan or scheme concept, and then they give you paragraph 111 that says, the required intent is the intent to dispose of property, not the intent to mislead the public in the disposition of such property, which is somewhat accurate, but ironically enough, misleading. Right? This intent here talks about the disposal. It's unlawful with intent to dispose. So you have to have an intent to sell something. Okay, great. And then you have to know that what you said was wrong. 
And they never quite get to the level of either acknowledging that, even though it's highlighted here, it's not emphasized, or proving that Universal knew when they made that trailer that Anna de Armas wasn't going to be in the movie, that there was an actual specific intent on their part to deceive. And like I said before, plan or scheme fits better with what they're accusing Universal of, but these plaintiffs don't want to deal with that intent question at all, so they just skip it. And they try to disarm the one intent they have to include in their quote in a fashion that doesn't matter at all. So we're through two counts, and we're not doing great. Then we have an alternative pleading for both classes of unjust enrichment. They don't point to any laws. They don't point to any precedent here whatsoever. They just say, as the intended and expected result of its conscious wrongdoing, they throw in a conscious, that's an intent concept there. Defendant has profited from and benefited from the sales, rentals, licenses, and public theater presentations of the movie yesterday and equity and good conscience militate against permitting defendant to retain those profits and benefits. They shouldn't have done this. They're bad people, your honor, and they shouldn't be allowed to keep their money. It's fine. It's an equitable kind of pleading. Doesn't really give you a lot of legal backstop to base your decision on, which leads us to dragging in the Maryland class. Breach of implied warranty. Plaintiffs reassert everything above. They bring this claim individually and on behalf of the Maryland class and say the following. The laws governing the sale of goods imply a warranty that the goods conform to the representations and specifications suppliers, merchants supply for the goods and that the goods are fit for the purposes underlying the goods sold. Now there's a hundred ways to write that better, but what they are saying is that the baseline rule in Maryland is that what we call implied warranties, you don't have to say them, you don't have to write them down, apply to most sales of goods. You see them reference here, sections two, 314, 315, and 316, which you know we're gonna take a look at, and that those implied warranties should be assessed against Universal because they were violated in doing what they did with Anna de Armas. Defendants' actions breached implied warranties made to consumers in violation of Maryland law. But here we're going to have to take another sojourn down law lane because we can take a look at these statutes and we can see exactly what they say. Unless excluded or modified, uh uh-oh, a warranty that the goods shall be merchantable is implied in a contract for their sale if the seller is a merchant with respect to goods of that kind. Now you see what I talked about at the top of this video, which is that the actual privity of contract between these plaintiffs and another party is with the provider of the streaming license. It's with Amazon or with whatever other service they wound up using for their $3.99. So the seller is a merchant, Amazon's a merchant, But if they need to be merchantable, they have to do the following. They have to pass without objection in the trade under the contract description. Pretty much accurate. We don't usually think about the Anna de Armas question when we're evaluating whether or not to rent a movie. In the case of fungible goods, which we don't have, so we can skip that, they are fit for ordinary purposes for which such goods are used. Presumably the streaming movie service provided a streaming movie. You just weren't happy with some of the characteristics within it. Run within the variations permitted by the agreement of even kind quality and quantity within each unit and among all units involved. Well, you only had one, so that doesn't really apply. Are adequately contained, packaged, and labeled as the agreement may require. We don't have a separate labeling agreement, but it's unclear whether there should be a warning message. No Anna de Armas, don't buy. And F, conform to the promises or affirmations of fact. Okay, we're close. Made on the container or label, if any. Oh no, the language in Maryland limits this to containers or labels. We're not even talking about other kinds of advertising here. Not a perfect fit. Might be able to convince someone, not a perfect fit. Let's go to the next one. Where the seller at the time of contracting has reason to know any particular purpose for which the goods are required. Uh Uh-oh. Well, first of all, you're probably never having a requirement contract for viewing of the movie yesterday or to be honest, any other movie, as important as I think they are to a good, well-lived life. So we're already starting from a bad place. We also are starting from a bad place because there's no reason for Amazon or Universal to know of your plaintiff's specific requirements on the Anna de Armas question. Further, the buyer has to be relying on the seller's skill or judgment to select or furnish suitable goods. That's how you wind up in the fitness for particular use implied warranty. Ugh, those don't appear to apply either. Well, Let's pretend that they do. We like to do that here. Let's pretend that they've got a good argument for both of these. We still have good old 2316, which 
to their power, they recognized as applicable here, which says language to exclude all implied warranties of fitness is sufficient if it states, for example, that there are no warranties which extend beyond the description on the face hereof, or unless the circumstances indicate otherwise, all employed warranties are excluded by expressions like as is, with all faults, or other language which in common understanding calls the buyer's attention to the exclusion of warranties and makes plain that there is no implied warranty. Well, remember, this transaction isn't with Universal directly. It's part of the problem with their legal documents. It's with Amazon. So you go to Amazon here and you say, oh, I want to get yesterday. We see here, oh, we don't reference Anna to Armas here. So there's no, there's no lies here. I want to rent it for $4. Uh-oh, by ordering or viewing, you agree to our terms. Oh, we should check those out. What do their terms say on this? Well, 6G says any dispute or claim arising from or relating to this agreement or the service is subject to the governing law. Makes sense. Disclaimer of warranties and limitation of liability, dispute resolution, and class action waiver, if applicable, and all other terms in the Amazon conditions of use of your video marketplace. Oh, you reference us out to a third document. Not ideal. Remember when we talk about the disclaimers that we're about to talk about, they are supposed to be something that the buyer can be aware of. This is a problem we have in the digital landscape. Amazon, big giant tech company, does this kind of thing. It embeds these kinds of references. So we know we have to go check out another document, which of course I have ready to check out for you. And there we find what we were looking for. The Amazon services and all information, content, materials, products, and other services included on or otherwise made available to you through the Amazon services are provided by Amazon on what basis? You already know the answer to this. On an as is and as available basis, unless otherwise specified in writing. To the full extent permissible by law, Amazon disclaims all warranties, express or implied, including but not limited to implied warranties of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose. It's almost like they know that issue is coming up and they know the law and they've got fancy lawyers to help them draft provisions like this one. Now, it's important to note the plaintiffs didn't sue Amazon here, but that creates its own issue because they don't actually have a contract with Universal. Universal distributes its movies to Amazon and then Amazon distributes those movies to consumers. So when we talk about implied warranties, that implied warranty is, if it exists at all, is probably between Universal and Amazon. And it's very difficult to make the case that that implied warranty, which we've already pointed out has its own problems, flows down to you especially when you agreed by clicking on that 399 button to all the terms we just read, including Activision, not Activision. That is because I've done all those videos for the last week. Amazon has disclaimed all of those particular warranties as part of its terms of service. So when you say they breached implied warranties, I got to say, objection, facts, not in evidence. We've got a lot of problems getting from there to here. And probably Maryland is included for this specific purpose. So it might not have made sense in the long run. Anyway, then you've got a generalized violation of Maryland's Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act, which kind of follows along with what California says. They don't really talk about the specifics of that law. They just have definitions that talk about deception, representation, false and misleading advertising. But again, Every single concept there is going to have some kind of mens rea, mental state, intentionality kind of concept. And it isn't going to be defeated simply by shouting to the heavens that you love Anna de Armas and you wish that she were in this film. Count six, you've got a breach of express warranty and violation of the Uniform Commercial Code for both classes. And there you really have to ask the question. So an express warranty is a warranty that's written down. It's something that somebody actually says to you. Where are the plaintiffs getting this at all? Paragraph 158 is all we have to go on where they say defendants yesterday movie trailer expressly warrants that the movie yesterday would feature Anna de Armas and other omitted scenes. Please point to the place on the trailer where the company that made it expressly warrants has a specific promise that this person will appear in this movie. Now you've got something close to a potential complaint on false advertising. It's a very weak case. It's likely to get kicked out, but that's at least in the ambit of possibility. When you claim that you've got an express warranty breach, you have to point to an express warranty. You can't just claim one was made out of the ether. So this one dies as well. So you got Maryland problems, you've got express warranty problems, and you might, you could potentially 
make a false advertising claim, if you could show a series of emails or specific intent to bring in Anna de Armas solely to sell movie tickets in a trailer for a film she was never intended to be in, but not even the plaintiffs make that claim. Now, what would they like for relief? They'd like a proper class action certification. Of course they would. And they'd like some restitution, a disgorgement of all profits to the class. They'd like them to correct their advertising campaign and they'd like it all decided by a jury. All I can say at the end of this is good luck plaintiffs. You clearly have some kind of class action attorney that's willing to go and take a weaker case all the way to the mattresses for you to get it reported in places like the Hollywood Reporter. But at the end of the day, we talk a lot about false advertising in the space. We talk a lot about the difficulties in bringing complaints that are much, 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 much stronger than this one. But anyone can sue anyone for anything, even if it gets kicked out in the first or second stage of the litigation. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy this content talking about the business and law of popular culture, software technology, Activision, sure, but also other things from time to time, please consider supporting the channel. We cannot do it without support from viewers and listeners like you. Otherwise, just subscribing, ringing the bell, upvotes, downvotes, sharing it in forums, Twitter, Reddit, wherever else you might find yourself, every single little bit helps. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.